You are listening to One Dime Radio. Become a patron at patreon.com slash one dime to support the show and get access to extra content. We think that ideology is something blurring, confusing our straight view. Ideology should be glasses which distort our view. And the critique of ideology should be the opposite. Like you take off the glasses so that you can finally see the way things really are. When you talk about a revolution, most people think violence without realizing that the real content of any kind of revolutionary thrust lies in the, in, in the principles and the goals that you're striving for, not in the way you reach them. Philosophers call someone a relative, by which they mean it's a person that holds that any view is as good as any other view. My simple response to that is this. No one holds that view. No one believes that every view is as good as every other view. Welcome to One Dime Radio. Today I am here with a very special guest, Aaron Good, host of the American Exception podcast, and who wrote a book which was one of my favorite books I read this year, American Exception, Empire in the Deep State. And we're here to talk about Aaron's book and the main topic being the deep state something a lot of people are quite afraid to discuss. There is actually scholars who seriously research this, like Peter Dale Scott and Aaron Good, who I'm very honored to have on my podcast today. Aaron, the first thing I want to ask is, how do we define the deep state? Because this is something you do very thoroughly in your book. I won't spoil it for the listeners, but what is the deep state? How are we defining it? Well, I think of it in the broadest sense as the deep state is really all of those institutions that allow for top-down governance in a nominal democracy. So it's the dictatorship that really prevails over our democracy and makes it so democracy can't really win. Now, that's the broadest sort of systemic sense. In that case, all of those anti-democratic institutions could be thought of as part of the deep state, including corporate media, the campaign finance system, different lobbies, things like that. In the biggest sense, that's like the deep state. And that corresponds pretty well with what people would call the establishment, with this other idea of like entrenched power that isn't really in the constitution, but persists no matter what. The other use of the term is often for the clandestine the darkest part of the state, like the national security state, the intelligence agencies, but those aspects of them that are opaque typically, and, or at least partial, only partially visible at best, and which can intervene in politics in ways that we don't understand. So we have things that happen and they come from some quadrant of the state. And we know the state had to have been, had a role in it, but it can't be investigated because whoever did it has is so powerful that there's not a more powerful authority to investigate it. It's the apex of the regime just is a political science term. And it just means not the, not just the organization of the government, you know, the, the entity that has a monopoly on the use of violence in a society, but, um, all of those institutions that control the access, who's going to have access to the state and who's going to be able to control the state. Like that's the regime. And that is the bigger, that is a bigger thing. The deep state is related to that idea too, even though it's deep state, deep regime. These things are, I'm more flexible with them. And and the key takeaway for me is that we're talking about a top-down rule, secretive top-down rule in a nominal democracy. And that has really been the nature of the U.S. system increasingly and increasingly since the end of World War II. And so this deep state was created to deal with the realities of having to manage a global empire while pretending to be a democracy, because those two things are really not compatible. You can't be lawful and democratic and also run a global empire. Right. And in the book, you talk about it as a double government of sorts, and you use multiple ways to describe it. Um, But some people might be saying, well, doesn't any capitalist democracy, isn't any capitalist democracy not truly democratic? They all have intelligence agencies. What makes America specifically have a deep state and which countries would you say have a deep state which ones don't because it might seem banal to you and after reading this book it's pretty obvious but it's it's something i notice a lot of um response i get when i talk about u.s democracy is a sort of marxist response will be to say well isn't this true everywhere but 
I mean, no, you wouldn't have titled it American Exception, probably if that was simply the case, right? Yeah, and the exception part is important, and we can come back to that. But the idea of double government is that, that that's actually, you're right that I say that there is a duality of the government in that there's the part that we see and then there's the part we don't see. So there is that duality. But the double government argument or the dual state arguments, I'm actually complicating them even more and saying it's really a tripartite, a tripartite as a state. So, and what this means is, first, let me explain the dual state. So the, the idea of a dual state comes from the Nazis and a guy named Ernst Frankel, who immigrated during World War II, came to the United States, and he wrote about, I think his book was titled The Dual State, A Study of Dictatorship. And he said that there was the normal state in Germany that, you know, performed weddings and had, you have the dog catcher and the local, you know, the courts and everything else. But then in Germany, because of the, you know, the emergency, you have this, this dual state, this dictator state, this prerogative state. And the prerogative state just can do whatever it wants. And it's supposedly doing whatever it, it decides to do to protect the normative state. But it's really this like dark thing. It's, you know, which now we just call Nazism, right? So that's this dictatorship. And it was put in because, oh, there's, it's so, we're in such great danger. There might be a, the state's in danger. There might be a communist revolution. They burned down the Reichstag. It was the Nazis that burned down the Reichstag, but they blamed it on communists. And so they create, they empowered Hitler. And he's like, I'm the Fuhrer principle. I'm the dictator. Whatever I say goes, that's how it is. Right? So that, that was a dual state. Now, after World War II, the U.S. defeats fascism, but it doesn't really give it the coup de grace. It doesn't make them all go to the guillotine and chop off their heads or anything like that. It actually rehabilitates a lot of them and repurposes them and puts them into these clandestine networks. So they're no longer like taking orders from the, the fear or whoever and being like out there as agents of fascism. They're like secretly part of a network that can intervene especially when democracy doesn't seem to be doing what the regime wants. So then the dark part of the state can emerge. So the tribe, the three part comes from this sort of top down aspect of, of oligarchy, really the lawless part of it, but it gets taken and removed from the formal visible security state, which is different from the democratic state. The three parts of the democratic state, which is what we're told really runs everything. And then there's a security state of like the Pentagon, the military, police agencies. And this is a little, it has some secrecy because it's got to keep us safe. And it has the ability to use violence sometimes because it's a dangerous world out there and so on. But, and it's more like hierarchical and kind of military like instead of being democratic, right? But over all of that, over the security state and really exercising power over democracy is the power of oligarchy. And they created clandestine networks. They shaped the security services to their needs and desires. But then they also added things that are just totally opaque and can intervene in politics in an oligarchic way. And the reason that the security, the national security state or the security state is pivotal is that potentially it could be used to rein in oligarchic power and lawless power. It could actually be, and this is where... This might sound crazy to say, but the police and the FBI and the CIA, they could actually uphold the law. They could go out there instead of breaking laws all the time, they could actually uphold the law. They could investigate criminals doing criminal things, but they don't. They actually work for criminal oligarchs by and large. And that is a, a reality that if you look at how the U.S. has performed its covert action around the world in places like Indonesia, Iran, all over Latin America, it is just a bloody legacy that really no one could defend if it were talked about honestly. And that is, that's really the nature of the deep state. The deep state, you could say, is a synecdoche for empire or empire. You could use empire that way. You could use oligarchy. In reality, these institutions like the CIA are created by capitalists to conspire to advance the interests of capitalists. It's a interesting sociological fact that Western Marxists are so scandalized when you start accusing the state of, you know, conspiratorial crimes. This is a real sh uh, blind spot, and it's a big problem for the left in the West. Right. And it's also because the U.S. is not just undemocratic by democratic standards, but it's undemocratic by liberal democratic standards in the sense that it doesn't even uphold the rule of law, which I like that. That's kind of the sort of 
component which you really use to judge the degree to which power is abused in America, because it's a really evaluating American democracy on its own terms, which makes a very powerful argument for those who are not just already on the left or already subscribed to kind of socialistic democracy instead. But it, it's an argument that you can easily weaponize against people who act like, well, it's the system of the rule of law, unlike, let's say, a Russia or unlike China. But after reading this book, it's clear why that's just a load, a load of nonsense. But um, you talk about the creation of the deep state, the creation of the national security agencies right during the inception of the Cold War after World War II, being the creation of the CIA, NSA. And what, one thing I found very fascinating is how you document the relationship between the corporate world and the creation of the CIA. And also the relation, as you were just alluding to, the relation between the CIA and organized crime. Frequent theme throughout the book being the relationship between the overworld and underworld and the CIA. Would you like to elaborate a bit on that? Because it might just, it's something you you alluded to that the relation, the, that relation, but someone who hasn't read your book might just dismiss that as some kind of wacko claim, but uh, you document that quite thoroughly. Yeah, I really try to focus on this following from Peter Dale Scott, who has done such brilliant work in this for many decades. Uh, he's now uh, getting ready to turn 95, I think, and uh, he's still putting out books. Um, and we're working on an oral history series with him, and he, he's done a lot on this, on the underworld and its relationship to the overworld. In, in a lot of U.S. history, organized crime and is, a, is a part of the history of capitalism, American capitalism especially. You have the use of organized crime networks to beat up labor organizers and do other dirty deeds when there's violence that needs to be done. Oligarchs can rely on their friends in the organized crime world. And they have connections because, you know, financial elites have uh, run banking enterprises that benefit from organized crime. Organized crime is very lucrative. So drugs are one of the top three, illegal drugs are one of the top three internationally traded commodities. And that money goes into the, the financial system. That's the case today. And that had to have been the case during, I mean, it's, it was different, but still there were illicit traffics and illicit trades that organized crime benefited from. And it did this with the help of the financial system going way back before, you know, well before World War II. I mean, this is just illicit economies, you know? I mean, a lot of Yale is basically all opium money and it was illegally sold in China, but nobody cared. And they were able to get away with that. And these huge fortunes were made there, like the Forbes family, um, the Cabot Lodge family, the Russell family is the, they're the people that set up the Skull and Bones Society at, at Yale. They gave Yale all the land up there. I mean, this is a, a part of capitalism and they would do things like what, what the CIA would do later. Like in 19, I think it's 1912 or 1914, there was a guy, a banana man, you know, a fruit company man, Sam Murray, and he sailed from New Orleans down to Honduras with a mercenary, you know, like a, a paid soldier of fortune and a mobster named Machine Gun Maloney. And he bribed some people in the military of Honduras and they overthrew the government just to put in a government that wouldn't tax their banana plantations. But then you fast forward to, you know, 40 years and then the CIA is doing the same thing. Or 50, I guess it would be, yeah, 40 years because 19, 1954, they have the coup in Guatemala. And it's just actually one of the same guys. Sam Zamuri was one of the main people when United Fruit uh, pressured the, the CIA and the government to have to overthrow the president of Guatemala because he was going to nationalize some uncultivated land, right? So the these organized crime networks are a part of this political, this capitalist political economy, and they do things that are useful for capitalists. And so organized crime is in a way tolerated crime. And it's tolerated by the oligarchy, which is deeply intertwined with the regimes in, in cities and states and uh, on the national level. Uh, organized crime is just a part of of capitalism, and it has been. And their their mentality is really about the same. I mean, somebody who's going to make money running numbers illegally, how is that really so morally different from like a coal miner who is or a coal baron who is sending little kids into coal mines? You know, for a, a lot of the twentieth century that was going on. So I mean, this is a very similar mentality. If you just like, what is it that the people want that I can sell to them that will make me very rich? This is the, the same mentality of capitalists or organized, organized crime networks. So this, and this, be, this becomes incorporated into the, in more intertwined with the state, because during World War II, the OSS, which was the precursor to the CIA, they 
spring, they want to make sure the docks are like safe for the U S right. And so they spring some mobsters from jail. Meyer Lansky says, why don't you get my friend Lucky Luciano out of jail? And then we'll make sure the docks are real nice for you. And of course, if you give them control of the docks, then they can also use that for floating lots of heroin and such, which they did. But then now they've got the sanction of Uncle Sam. And then after World War II ends, that relationship continues with the CIA. They use these people for, um, they use these people to do all sorts of dirty deeds, like trying to kill Castro, for example, setting up heroin trafficking networks to fund illegal armies in Taiwan and Laos and so on. I mean, that uh, fascinated me the most, actually. I, I had no idea about the initiatives with the KMT and, and the those are yeah, actually probably listeners would be very curious about that because I have a lot of viewers who came to my channel now due to my series on the Cultural Revolution and Chinese history. So, yeah. Yes, that part is strange. I lived in Taiwan for a year, which so I, I mean, I love Taiwan, but it's I didn't quite appreciate it at the time because I was just out of college that it was like a narco state, essentially, like they were such fascists and thugs really on the mainland and then an oligarchy really. And then they fled, they stole a lot of the art, which ended up being almost fortunate in a way because it might've gotten smashed in the cultural revolution. You know, China went through some strange ups and downs during that time period. But, uh, the KMT was the main way that they were able to get the capital that they needed to become one of the Asian tigers who had industrialized, you know, that was the term that they gave them back in the day for Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea, Japan, and Taiwan, right? They called them the Asian tigers. But the reason that, that Taiwan was able to industrialize in large part, that capital came from the opium traffic, which was sanctioned by the CIA. And it came from a CIA operation called, Op well, it was first an, an off the books operation, really. It was like a world commerce corporation thing run by like Rockefellers and William Stevenson of the, the British and then William Donovan the OSS founder, the chief of the OSS, right? And then he's sort of freelancing and they set up this, they set up this heroin connection, which eventually the CIA adopts. And that grows into the later into the connection in Laos, this golden triangle connection. But the KMT, they set up this airline, Air America with the CIA. It's a joint proprietary thing that's owned, I think mostly by the KMT. So the CIA can say it's not ours, but the KMT was, they were big. They were the biggest heroin traffickers for a long time. And this is interesting because now the KMT actually is the more conciliatory side towards China, which is funny today, but back in the forties and fifties, you know, after the revolution, right. But the KMT were in Burma and on the border of China and they were there supposedly to retake the mainland. Uh, they, they thought like, yeah, we're going to get them. We're going to go back and take it over. But in reality, they were like, this, we're getting our asses kicked every time we get into any sort of fight or skirmish, but we have become pretty good at growing hair or growing opium. So why don't we just do that? And that's what they did. And they became, that, that's the source of, that's the beginning of what becomes the golden triangle heroin traffic in the post-war era that really Peter Dale Scott did more than anyone to expose. Al McCoy gets credit for it, but in part that's because the CIA intervened to, to mess with Peter Dale Scott and sabotage him. From getting his book out on time and they even stole one of his articles from being published at ramparts magazine back in 1971. one theme that runs throughout your book is that of organized criminality and criminality against the state itself against elected presidents this is probably the most controversial aspect of the whole book and this is the theme the themes of the deep events you talk about structural deep events and these events in which the deep state is undermining the elected government and the democratic part of our government. You talk really, if I, correct me if I'm mistaken, four deep events, the Kennedy assassination, Nixon's Watergate scandal, the Iran-Contra um, Iran -Contra scandal, which is between Carter and Reagan, and 9-11. Um, I love to get into these straight away, but one thing that runs through at least two of these events is the Doomsday Project. That's something I think listeners probably all, really all of them yeah so yeah I, th I think maybe before we get right into those events would you like to explain what the doomsday project was because it really runs through all of these and uh um, sure yeah that was something i found fascinating i have too and would like to know more about it i just built on what peter had done and, and found a few more things but really peter is the person who was the trailblazer on this issue as with many others peter dow scott now 
if, let me say what deep event is first. So the deep event is more or less something that comes from the clandestine world and it grow. It, it's, it, it never, it's not what it seems to be. And you know, accounts are falsified and that you're just not going to get to the bottom of it. That's a, a deep event in the generic sense. Now, Peter makes the distinction of a structural deep event, which is actually a, a much more impactful and it tends to it has a historical impact and it changes the structure of governance in the united states and he points to those four events jfk assassination watergate um iran contra and 9 11 as being deep event the structural deep events that had real impacts and they came from some dark unknown source in in our system so the significance of the structural deep event oh, there was something that you asked me about that that i wanted to well, it was about, I was about going to ask about the Doomsday Project. Because oh yeah, the Doomsday, the, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yes, thank you. The Doomsday Project is, does run through these, these events in ways that are where we see it, but that's, we don't know what, ha what the real, the real deal there, what really happened, because it's the, perhaps the most secret part of the U.S. government, because the Doomsday Project is also called Continuity of Government, and it's a, a, a series, well, it's a network of agencies, entities, individuals who, which can be activated under emergency circumstances. And this was created so that there's no loss of command and control power. And so it's in case there was a decapitation strike and the vice president and the U.S. president were cut off or not able to communicate with the government or they were dead, you would still have some sort of power somewhere, right? To intervene in an emergency. When does this start? You said it starts under Eisenhower, the, but under Reagan, it really gets, it metastasizes. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that there may have been some rudimentary things under Truman, but really under, under, under Eisenhower, it it's, achieves a more mature form. And in a way, this is kind of the evolution of the, the deep state. I, I, it didn't come out fully formed, but I think it kind of goes through a number of changes until it really reaches uh, a more serious full-on deep state form, which I say was consolidated by Ronald Reagan. But this doomsday project was established so that by, by military people largely, but the key thing was that many of the people that would be a part of this network that could act as a would-be dictatorship panel, um, they were private citizens. As many, I think a majority of them under Eisenhower, when he put this group together, were private citizens who were, which are, makes them essentially like oligarch figures. Um, who would be called in and given dictatorial power over things like censorship, rounding up dissidents and other things. It was really meant to be done in response to a nuclear strike, but it had more implications and applications than just that. And that especially evolves over time. Now, in the Kennedy, in the JFK case, I increasingly think that the Doomsday Network may have been activated. They may have used some sort of pretext that Kennedy was talking to Castro secretly, which he was using back channels to communicate with Castro because he didn't trust his CIA and his, you know, we're even worried about diplomats, I think. Um, so he was, was also using back channels to communicate with Castro. He was friendly with somebody who was known to be a Soviet spy, but this was like known as a way to keep in, have a person to communicate with who would be in touch with the government, right? Um, so this was perhaps used as a pretext. And then if you present something like that as a huge emergency, then perhaps they use continuity of government resources to, on that day, we know that the person, I believe in the car in front of Kennedy, his name was Jack Crichton. He's an oil man. Um, and he's part of the Texas um, or the national, he has a job in the military intelligence and, and with the reserves, but also connected to continuity of government, right? He was involved in like the civil defense, which is a continuity of government program in Texas. And additionally, in that with the Kennedy assassination, it later emerged that the White House Communications Agency, which is part of this continuity of government thing, they said um, that, oh, yeah, we were there documenting the events of Dallas, uh, November 22nd, 1963, right? The problem was that those tapes have never been released by anyone. No one was aware that entity was operating there. And so... What were they doing on that day? Um, the taking the um, president to the naval hospital to have his autopsy and having the Joint Chiefs do it, and that there was a big cover up at the autopsy, suggests that the Joint Chiefs, the top of the the military brass, were involved in this, uh, and that they sanctioned it and were ready for it, and likely with overriding continuity of government authority, that they would 
have used to make sure that everything was going to go the way that they wanted to and that they couldn't fail on that day. It seems there's a lot of reason to think that may be actually what happened. It's not as neat as, oh, it was a CIA operation, but you know, Alan Dulles was out of the CIA. A lot, most people think that John McCone was not witting. He was the actual CIA director. And the head of the Secret Service, the head of the Treasury was Dylan, an oligarch from high finance, the guy that whose own lawyers and bankers like James Forrestal created the CIA in the first place. People from the Dylan family, Dylan Reed, that bank, right? So the Secret Service was not on Kennedy's side. I don't think that the Pentagon, the top of the Pentagon, Max Taylor, even though Kennedy thought he was his friend, I think that he betrayed Kennedy. Um, so really key figures in the CIA, in the Joint Chiefs at the very top with Max Taylor and probably the rest of the Joint Chiefs, they were against Kennedy. The person in charge of the Secret Service, who's the Treasury Director, Dylan is an oligarch, CIA. This the kind of person that the CIA was created for, really. Um, so there, I think that Kennedy lost the support of the empire and the oligarchy that, that, that runs things and owns things and is not candid about what its objectives really are. Generally, they actually go along with the sort of democratic, you know, theater, but really they expect to be able to run things the way they wanted to. And Kennedy wanted to break with a consensus, a cold war consensus. And for that, he was killed. Now in Iran, in Watergate, James McCord was one of the guys in the Office of Security, which is the handling these big secrets all the time. Like when Frank Olson had to be assassinated, apparently um, he, uh, James McCord was the person sent in to cover that up, right? He may have been the person that was, um, who had uh, dealt with setting up the ass assassination in the first place, right? Frank Olson, who was assassinated in 1953, right? A, a CIA scientist who seemed to be having misgivings about bio war warfare. He gets thrown out of a window, right? Well, later this guy surfaces in Watergate and he's in jail and he's like refusing to sign, take a plea deal. And he seems really intent on damaging Nixon and he ends up taking down Nixon. And Nixon had a, Nixon told people later in life that he felt like the people that killed JFK were the people behind Watergate. And this guy McCord, who had worked in continuity of government, he'd worked in operations for a group called, an outfit called WISP which deals with like information, WISP is the acronym, but he was supposed to be rounding up dissidents and putting together censorship regimes if there were a national emergency. So that's in Watergate continuity of government emerges. Again, the COG Doomsday Network, this overriding authority of emergency power emerges in these. In, in Now in Iran-Contra, it's used by uh, Oliver North when he wants to communicate in ways that can't be monitored by other government agencies. He uses this flash switchboard system that allowed him to communicate as he's like, you know, arranging who knows what cocaine shipments and weapons shipments, whatever. So it's there in Iran-Contra and it comes up in discussion during testimony on in Congress and a senator says, we need to stop this conversation. We this will have to go into a, you know, private session. Um, and on 9-11, the Doomsday Network is activated by, apparently, by Dick Cheney, whose, um, whose moves on that day and whose timeline has been contradicted by other testimony and by Cheney himself. But apparently he made a call on some secure COG network and may have transmitted a very sensitive order on 9-11, perhaps related to, a sh to the shoot down, to a shoot down in Pennsylvania. Um, we don't really know because it's kept secret, but Cheney and Rumsfeld had been working all through the 90s under Clinton. Secretly, they were working on uh, continuity of government programs. And then when they take office under Bush, you have 9-11 and con that system gets activated that they'd been working on all this time. We still don't know what emergency measures are in effect because of 9-11 to this day. And that is um, pretty amazing when you think about it. But this is a level of secrecy created with military people, but also with private people. The input of private people, sometimes under Eisenhower, selecting private oligarch citizens who would be dictators in the case of an emergency. And we don't even really know the contours of this because it's classified. And when you when congressional, when representatives have tried to inquire about this, like Pete DeFazio, I believe, was one who did. He was told that you can't be told this because it's it's classified under continuity of government provision. So they, we don't even know what emergency powers the U.S. government has asserted since 9-11 through continuity of government networks and you know, planning that they had done. And we're, we're not allowed to know what we don't 
what we don't know about this. It's in Congress renews it every year, the state of emergency that they've renewed every year since 9-11, which is bizarre because now at the same time, we're basically backing Al Qaeda in some weird ways throughout, you know, the 2010s and so on with Syria and Libya and that, but we still have all these emergencies, emergency laws in place or provisions, secret things. We don't even know what, what's going on. I believe it was in one of your interviews, might've been on Chapo Trap House, where you were talking about how Trump in one of his speeches was saying that he has secret powers and he was kind of inadvertently potentially revealing the Doomsday Project. Is that yeah, so? He, he may, that may have been what it was a reference to. It's hard to really know. I mean, Trump says things without always maybe thinking it through whether he should be saying it or, or not. But yeah, he would have. And, um, you know, he's a character who's, he seemed to be de trying to struggle against these forces in some ways. I mean, you had Chuck Schumer telling him, saying on like Meet the Press or whatever, don't mess with the CIA. They can get back at you six ways from Sunday, right? I mean, that is a strange thing. The CIA is supposed to work for the president. Like, what kind of system is Chuck Schumer talking about that we have here? But yeah, Trump made some weird references to it. And we, it, it's hard to know how much the president is really in command of all these things or, or what the president learns. Does Trump have the ability to blackmail the U.S. government himself as well? And they have all this dirt on him. They, maybe they'll arrest him. Maybe they won't. I mean, this is, this, these are the consequences of having a system with such endemic criminality. The, it's, you're, it's so ripe for blackmail and other kinds of chicanery it, it, that it's going it to eventually may topple uh, by virtue of its own top-heavy corruption. So what I found most interesting that I want to dive in most is definitely Nixon and Watergate because the idea that CIA whacked Kennedy. Some people think that shouldn't even be a conspiracy anymore. And at least there's more popular documentation on that with Oliver Stone's documentaries, his one in the 90s and also his re most recent one. I recommend people watch the Parkland Doctors, and it just has interviews with the doctors. And if you just hear them talking about Kennedy's wounds, you're like, okay, it's obvious what happened, and it's obvious that it had to have been covered up right away. It's quite straightforward, so among other things. But anyway, sorry, I just wanted yeah, to that. Yeah, that was in there. the Stone documentary. Yeah, that was, I highly recommend that. Um, so and I think a lot of listeners probably are they're, they're somewhat convinced by that relation. But the one I had no idea about which surprised me. And I first heard you, this is why I bought your book at, at first, was I, I heard you on Chapo Trap House talking about Nixon and how Nixon thought that the same people who did were behind Watergate were the same people behind J JF Kennedy. And he euphemistically refers to as the Bay of Pigs, right? Yeah. You talk about that in your book. If you could uh, get into that, the mystery of Watergate, because that's something okay. I think I'd never see anyone cover. I will say that Nixon is a strange character because as you point out, he was, he was not an anti-establishment person. He was not a radical leftist. He was well to the right of JFK. And yet it does appear that he was taken down by some of these same forces. And I don't have a perfect understanding of, of why he had to go. Um, but I, it, it seems that when you look at the aftermath of it, it led to a shift to the right in the United States. Like you had Ford the Ford White House was not was put in to replace him. It was not to Nixon's left. It was to Nixon's right. And you shortly after Nixon resigned, you had this, what was called the Halloween Massacre. And it was done by Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney, really. They orchestrated this. like they. So somehow we have to understand how these guys got empowered to, to do something so dramatic. The result was that you had a, a move to the right, really, across many important positions. You had Kissinger replaced by Scowcroft, who was less of Kissinger's kind of, you know, realist, realpolitik, vaguely liberal in some ways. I mean, as bad as Kissinger was, and as much as liberals love to virtue signal about denouncing Kissinger for his horrible crimes, which were horrible, he's not so different from the rest of the people that were running the country. And he's not as, he's not as bad as the Reagan foreign policy team, the neocons. He's like maybe 5% better than those guys. But so when you look at that aspect of it, what was put in immediately after Nixon, you see that it marked a, heart, a turn to the right. You had Bill Colby replaced by the, who wanted to sort of disclose some things and reform the CIA a little bit. He gets replaced by George H.W. Bush, who is, you know, an establishment, a spooky establishment character. And so that really is the end of the cooperation with the investigations into the intelligence agencies and so on. 
Um, and you had Nelson Rockefeller drop from the ticket and the Republicans are become no longer the sort of liberal corporate liberal, admittedly moderate party. And they, they become more the party of Reagan, party of uh, Reaganite conservatism. So Empire and Wall Street become, you know, the heart of the Republican Party and Southern racists. And so the, Nixon's removal is very strange. He struggled with the CIA. The CIA seems to have been involved in trying to get him into trouble by having these guys get arrested. It looks like McCord and Hunt wanted that thing to be bungled somehow, whether they was for, to be arrested or whether they even knew, whether Hunt even knew exactly what the plan was, I don't know. But when you look at their actions, um, James McCord is very suspicious. He was involved not just in that 1953 Frank Olson assassination, but also he was involved in uh, JFK assassination. He was running illegal operations for the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, which is that same entity that made out Oswald look like he was a communist. And probably Oswald was acting as like somebody in, in a mission like the kind James McCord was running. And then all of a sudden he's the Watergate burglar and he won't cut a deal. As I said earlier, he just wants to really do ma inflict maximum damage on Nixon. And he even writes a letter to someone saying that if they fire Richard Helms, it, every tree in the forest will fall. It will be a scorched desert. Well, Nixon does fire Helms and then everything goes to shit in his second term because he is being attacked with Watergate. And the whole, across the establishment, you have the liberal, the Kennedys and the liberal Democrats want to go after Nixon. The hardline militarists want to go after Nixon and the economic corporate liberal uh, elites want to go after Nixon as well, because he's doing things like, you know, establishing the Environmental Protection Agency, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, that's established by Nixon. He ex expanded the Voting Rights Act. He passed a lot of regulation and other things that were like kind of New Deal style liberal reforms in many ways. I mean, he was well, he was much more liberal than Basic Even, income for families too. Yeah, he proposed that. He proposed national health insurance at one point, and then he ends up going in the other direction and helping establish these HMOs. But it was he wanted to be kind of a liberal reformer, and he was kind of a nationalist. And I think one of the things that may have done him in was he was going to disrupt. And this is something that I that no people hadn't really said before. So I think I uh, can can point to this as something that the book adds. I believe that part of Nixon's problem with those financial overlords like the Rockefellers and so on is that he wanted to deal with the dollar problems and the trade deficits of the U.S. by having protectionist measures against, you know, Japan and in Western Europe that would have potentially created pressures to get those countries away from the dollar and try to come up with some other solution. And they had other plans for the dollar. They wanted to establish the dollar as this new currency that they could just pr print infinitely because everybody used it around the world. But in order to do that, you had to please the elites in some other countries, especially Western Europe and Japan. That's why they create the Trilateral Commission for exactly that reason. And that's Rockefeller's commission. But what Nixon had in mind was actually sticking it to Western Europe and these other countries that were running up trade deficits. He was blaming them with whom the U.S. was running up trade deficits because Nixon was blaming them, saying they're doing all these practices to hurt us trade-wise, so now we got to put some tariffs in place and that'll stick it to them, right? But that had the risk of potentially disrupting the new monetary system they were trying to establish. That may have, Nixon's nationalism and the fact that he wanted to support domestic manufacturing, that may have, that was a disagreement that he had with these neoliberals that were emerging and the Rockefeller types who created the Trilateral Commission, they had different plans for the economy. They didn't really want a strong national economy. I think as bad as Nixon was, as a you know fanatical anti-communist and a character with criminal proclivities and tendencies, he was a nationalist. And he actually had some concern for the poor because he was a, a Quaker who was not wealthy, is from California. He was different than the, the Bushes, the Dulleses. He was a different person and uh, I mean, a ruthless bastard for, for sure and a criminal and a liar. But I think that he wanted to, he, he had some sense of like, an, he was a nationalist in the sense that he wanted to do things that would be good for the U, United States, the American nation state. I mean, so it, he, that's why he's confused about what's really happening to him uh, during all of this. It's really like the Watergate burglars and so on. He had enemies in his own White House. And there's, the tapes only are exposed to the White House probably because 
a CIA officer who had infiltrated the White House and then was called to testify in front of Congress. And then he, oops, he accidentally says that there's a White House taping system. And that le that's really what does him in, because otherwise it would have been a he said, she said thing with John Dean and Richard Nixon, right? But then somebody comes in and just serendipitously says this. But you look at Nixon in, earlier in his presidency, and even when this happens, he is trying to get dirt on the CIA. He sends his deputy over saying, asking about this at one point. And then later he himself has a conversation with Richard Helms, the director. And he asking says, about like, I really... the Kennedy assassination, right? Yes, yes. And he says, this whole who shot Jack angle, I, I need to know, I need the files on this because if it comes up again, I want to be able to protect the dirty tricks department, you know, and he's making all these arguments and he's saying like, you know, how's it supposed to work? Like a president comes in and he doesn't even know what the last guy did. You guys need to give me this information. And they never would. And I think that they perceived Nixon was trying to get power over the agency and they wanted to get power over him perhaps. And that's why they have him infiltrated with people by people like E. Howard Hunt and so on. Nixon thinks that, like, because he has Hunt on his side, it's going to help him because he's going to have dirt on the agency, right? I mean, it doesn't end up working that way. I mean, Nixon goes down and his crimes are not, I mean, they're not that remarkable compared to a standard operating procedure of the United States. What is different is the things that the FBI and CIA were doing illegally to subvert democracy in the U.S. in places like they had done around the world. Nixon was doing these more personal on a personal level, and he was using them against political enemies. Although he may have said, hey, the Democrats are like, they might be working with Fidel Castro. We've got to investigate them, right? That would have been his argument. That's probably what, it, what he would have said, something to that effect, if it had gone to, to the trial in the Senate. But he resigned for whatever reason. Um, so it, it was, Nixon was a criminal, but it was... What he was saying is essentially you've got the state doing all these criminal things that are illegal, but like supposedly in the national interest, why, how can you go after the president for doing this? When the president does it, it's not illegal because we're doing all these illegal things and supposedly the president is in charge of it. And that's been going on for decades now by the time Watergate happened. I mean, it's actually not as what Nixon was arguing in the reality of it is not as clear cut as the liberals want to make it seem like, oh, the president doesn't break the law. He's not above the law. Well, Actually, he is. Like, how do you explain everything that every other president has done, which was illegal? So you got to explain why Nixon is to be held accountable legally, but none of the other people are. It was a political thing, and it was a top-down sort of thing that Nixon had to go. And uh, it, But Nixon tried to resist, and he had some power because he was the president, so it led to a whole lot of exposures of secrets and crimes, which came out, and that ended up leading to the investigations afterwards because of the leak wars, really. Nixon's enemies leaked things about his crimes. Nick's pro-Nixon people would leak things about the crimes of the CIA and the FBI and the press. And it became this like war over leaks and crimes of the different sides. But in the end, Nixon ends up losing. Right. And what I found to be the more compelling motive behind why Kent Nixon was shut out and uh, why Watergate unraveled the way it did was his foreign policy, which is something you talk about in the book, is that he supported detente. He supported peace with not only the Chinese, but later the Soviets. And that's something, a faction of the foreign policy establishment, the more further right, neo proto-neocon establishment did not like whatsoever. They didn't like that more Kissinger realist type of foreign policy. Um, I thought that was the more compelling motive because you can really see that continuity after Nixon is sacked. You see a kind of foreign policy that's way more unconciliatory with regard to the other foreign powers. Yeah, I think that there's two aspects there, but I think that the military side of it is actually the junior one, the military and the more hawkish spooks who like are just spooks. I think that they don't, they're people who are fit into machinery that the, the corporate elites really create. Like that's what happens at the end of World War II. That's the reason the military industrial complex is created. It's created not because the military is so effective at arguing about how great war, the war machine is. It's because the people who run the Council on Foreign Relations, you know, Wall Street's big think tank, and they end up being in high positions in government sometimes, they were looking at the, the situation of the trade balances between countries. And they realized that if they did not, with the Marshall funding about to run out for Europe, Europe was not going to be able to enter to earn enough dollars to, to buy American products and the planned economy that would be centered with the dollar around the dollar was not really feasible. 
because the the your the American economy was too powerful and productive to really need much from the Europeans. And the solution for that was creating the military industrial complex, which does empower generals and does empower military contractors. But it was really uh, done at the pleasure of the financial, you know, Wall Street elites. They put this in. Now, by the time you get to Watergate, yeah, they're their own. They have their own power base. And I think that they are against Nixon and how Nixon is pursuing detente against Russia with Russia and China. But I, but they, um, so they were anti-Nixon. I think they get brought along for that. I don't think they understood the designs of the financial people. I think that the financial oligarchs and the corporate people that really just deal with money and making lots of money in business, like they have all the money in the world, essentially. Like they create the system of money in the first place. They own it. Federal Reserve pays them dividends all the time. I mean, it's really a financial oligarchy and a corporate oligarchy in the United States. And the military gets created and it becomes its own power base. And it might have some scary powers in the case of an emergency, but I, I don't think that they're in the driver's seat by and large. It's, it's this other, these other forces. And so for Nixon, I think he did have, he had the Kennedy and the, the Kennedy wing of the Democrats against him. And they probably thought it was a victory when, when he went down, but he also had the, the hawkish military people and the right wing, you know, spooks against him. And he had the financial establishment against him. So which one of those was the most decisive? It's hard to say, but there was just not much that Nixon had going for him. And he was left confused about who really were his enemies. Even after the fact it had to, he was paranoid for good reason. He did have enemies. They did take him down. And at the end of the, when it was all said and done, he never even totally understood who the enemies were. And neither do we as Americans. We still don't know what happened because that's the kind of system that we have. We have a, a deep state system. In your book, you kind of paint this picture that since Reagan, pretty much every president has been subservient to the deep state. And that leaves us with the question is, well, what about President Carter? Jimmy Carter is one of those presidents where a lot of people have a soft spot because of his background. And he, he, there's an intuitive feeling that he had a, a softer side that other presidents after him did not. I, didn't, I never saw Carter as an anti-establishment president, mainly due to his foreign policy when it came to Latin America was pretty horrific. But what I found, what I always found quite suspicious, and I think many people feel the same, was the Iran-Contra scandal. The fact that you had, he couldn't free the hostages when he was president, but suddenly Reagan gets elected, hostages are freed. It's just so suspicious. So many people are like, what's up with that? And you investigate this quite thoroughly. And, and of course, Peter Dale Scott considers this to be a structural deep event, right? So yeah, if we go into that a bit with regard to Carter and why would the CIA be hostile to Carter? Because he wasn't exactly that radical either. Now, Carter was handpicked by David Rockefeller's Trilateral Commission. He was an agribusiness guy from the South um, and they wanted a Southern Democrat. They were, they were choosing between him and a guy in Florida, Ruben Askew, right? And then for uh, randomly, more or less, they just, they settle on Jimmy Carter. He becomes the guy joins the trilateral commission with Brzezinski and Rockefeller. And he is, gets all this great press because Rockefeller, you know, has friends and media and everything else. So he's on the cover of Time Magazine as though he's doing these great things. And he's just more or less created by the media. And it's a media campaign to like make him the kind of inevitable president. But he's not as, he wants to actually reform some things in the U.S. Like he's a, a not a fundamentally okay guy, but he also wants power. So that's, you know, dubious in a sense, but he doesn't have the hardline Reagan policies. He does pursue some deregulation, which is what Carter wanted, because it seemed like that was what the Trilateral Commission was all about. It was like, oh, we've got these problems with the economy. It must be because of regulation. So let's cut regulation. I mean, really like the Vietnam War spending, the oil crises, the Volcker shock, that those are more serious causes, but set that aside. So Jimmy Carter was sort of a Reagan. He was like Reagan before Reagan in some ways with deregulation and so on. But he did try to have Afghanistan some reforms. Policy. Yes. And especially at the end, towards the end of his presidency, Jimmy Carter is thinking like, well, I'm going to try to, I'll try to please some of these right wing forces. So he passes more serious financial deregulation and he has some hawkish military. He calls for a big defense spending buildup, right? He passes a budget that has a big increase in defense spending. And he gives, okay, Brzezinski's plan to use um, 
jihadis to destabilize Afghanistan, and they and that provokes a Soviet invasion. So this was Afghanistan was really a U.S. trap that the Soviets fell into, and the U.S. was so happy about it, it killed you know a million Af people in Afghanistan, ruined many lives in the Soviet Union. It, it was a totally senseless thing, but oh, it hurt the Soviets, so it was a good thing, right? That was the thinking at the time. Um, and it wasn't exactly Carter's style so much, but he was really pressured into it. And he was pressured into, by David Rockefeller, this huge lobbying campaign to allow the Shah to uh, enter the United States. And he said at the time, he said, what about, what are you guys going to do when all of the Iranian protesters take, go into the embassy and take our people hostage? What are you going to do then? Right. He said that at the time. And that, that's exactly what ended up happening. And the punchline to all that is, is that when uh, these people are trying to make sure he doesn't get reelected, David Rockefeller himself, the guy who boosted him in the first place, eventually defects and joins the side with the Reagan campaign people and the CIA people to sabotage the negotiations over the hostages. I mean, that's a really remarkable thing that he did that. Now, I'm going to say what he did with the CIA. The reason that the CIA had beef with Carter is that he had fired George H.W. Bush and he'd put in his friend from the Naval Academy, Stansfield Turner, to run the CIA. And Stansfield Turner had a mandate to clean up the agency, right? He was supposed to fire some of the worst guys, so he did. He fired people like Stansfield Turner. I'm sorry, Stansfield Turner. Stansfield Turner fired people like Ted Shackley, Ray Kleins, um, Ed Wilson, I think, was fired, right? These guys that were the most notorious covert operators, he fired some of these people. Now they go off and they basically become freelancers and, they, and some of them, like Shackley, get involved with a safari club, which is basically like all the right-wing spooks and all the people that had to go sort of into hiding because of those post-Watergate investigations and then Carter's cleaning house at the CIA. They form this like off-the-books uh, thing with Saudi oil money and, you know, I Israeli actors and Iranians and Egyptians. And they basically have their own secret CIA yeah, totally I was detached ask from the agency. That, the safari club and these non-state organizations, which kind of are almost outsourcing of the deep state you know, in this kind of weird yeah. way. I mean, it shows that they will operate and they have a base of support and networks that really transcend anything authorized by the Constitution because uh, the CIA was authorized by Congress through with uh, the National Security Act of 1947. And they really take that and run with it and stretch it beyond anything that was ever intended. They really just said the CIA will do some other things assigned by the National Security Agency, right? Or National Security Council. That was the passage in 1947 in the legislation that they used to justify basically all kinds of covert op operations that are, you know, unimaginable. All the illegal dirty tricks that they were doing was basically justified by a line in the, some legislation that said the CIA will do some other things from time to time, more or less. So Carter, you know, Carter tried to clean that up a little bit, but the point was that or the problem was that these were created so that to be like a secret police for Wall Street, like they, it, they were really the servants of the most powerful people in the world, but they had the sanction of the president and the almighty, the U.S. government. But in reality, they were an instrument of like oligarch control and, and violence on behalf of an oligarchy of corporate wealth. Uh, and so when Carter tries to rein that agency in and tries to control their chicanery, the chicanery just is taken to another level. And it continues. So they have all of these CIA sock puppets and cutouts like the World Anti-Communist League and the Korean CIA and the Iranian CIA or the, the Iranian Intelligence Agency, um, SAVAK. They had all of these entities that could operate even if the CIA was like not really going to be the hub of it anymore. But when Reagan takes over, then it, it gets brought back into the fold, you know, and that's where it's been, you know, ever since. But with very little accountability a lot of things assigned to private outfits and to even who knows who. It's really, there's a whole clandestine netherworld that is a, a part of the U.S. empire. And it's hard to know if anyone really has, who has the most control over it and if anybody has much control over it at all when it comes down to it. Yeah. And you talk about how the negotiation of the hostage releases was undertaken without Jimmy Carter's knowledge. And in so in a way that allowed for the freeing of the hostages after the election, because um, if they were freed before, it would be good for Carter. Um, I'd like some clarification on that, just because that might not be so clear to the listeners. And 
follow-up question to that is which is related to the safari club and that exact period of time which i thought was also another thing i had no idea about really or i didn't think about it that way at least was um the oil price shock and the forces behind the scenes orchestrating that in a way because that's typically understood as just an economic event that destabilized capital crisis of capitalism rather as opposed to this specific sector of actors right make, it, was a make deep this happen. Event. it was more of a economic deep event the oil crisis of 1973 the yom kippur war you look at both of the sides the belligerents were u.s allies i mean egypt was a u.s egypt and saudi arabia uh, egypt nasser was dead they had a cia asset sadat basically running the country and then, uh, you know, the Egyptian, the Saudis as well. And then um, the Israelis, of course. And what was the impact of that war? It just really led to a huge spike in oil prices. How did that help the U.S.? Well, it dealt with the fact that there were all these dollars in central banks because of Vietnam War spending. And the countries were not happy about it. They wanted to be paid in gold for this. And the U.S. said, we're not going to give you gold anymore. We're going to go back on the deal that we'd made earlier. So they really defaulted on it. And they basically... Well, the Secretary of the Treasury said in 1973, John Connolly, he says, it's our currency, but it's your problem. And what in so the oil crisis seems to have been ginned up uh, by uh, the deep state, more or less, to quadruple oil prices and deal with the dollar overhang. And the Saudi, rate, right? well, that's later. That's, that's, the, uh, that's later up. under Carter. That's later under Carter, which we'll get to. But the Saudi oil minister, a guy named Sheikh uh, Yamani, he said to the, he told the Guardian around 2000, he said, look, I went to the Shah and the, it was either the Shah told him or he told the Shah, but they was like, why are you against this? The Henry Kissinger told me he wants these prices raised. And so we're raising the oil prices. So this was n known to be like, yeah, this was a plot. And you understand why Kissinger's a Rockefeller man, but also somebody intertwined with Wall Street because Standard Oil, the Rockefellers, they get broken up. You've got these oil companies, but you've also got Chase Manhattan and all these other businesses. I mean, this is just corporate power. And that's really who Kissinger represented. He was a Rockefeller man. And so these were, that was the way the dollar issue was handled initially. But the other part of that is later under Carter, and there's still oil shocks under Carter, which damaged his presidency. And maybe they were done precisely for that reason by that time. But also under Carter, he takes David Rockefeller's advice to bring in Volcker, Paul Volcker, to run the Fed. And he raises interest rates. He deals with inflation by really raising interest rates. And that has the effect of plunging the third world into debt because all that oil money had actually been loaned out to third world countries. And so when they raised this, these interest rates so high, they went into, into default. But that was like something economically the U.S. was going to really benefit from under Reagan because they could buy up all these things at fire sale prices when the economies collapse. Under you Carter, he just labor dealt unions. Yes, it, it does as well. I mean, it's horrible all around. It's a huge win for the oligarchy. And under Carter, he's um, he only had the bad effects of this. He didn't get the good. I mean, the good. It wasn't even good for Reagan exactly, except that it involved so much looting for corporate America. And the rest of America profited at the expense of the rest of the world. It didn't trickle down to American you know, workers that much. But under Carter, he was basically undone by oil shocks which he could not control, but the oil majors really could and their client friends in the oil countries, oil producing countries. The interest rates, which Rockefeller basically foisted on him by making him have Volcker come in. And then the hostage crisis, which is foisted on him because Rockefeller lobbies him so much to allow the Shah to be admitted into the United States, which is what led to the hostage crisis, just as Carter predicted, but was powerless to stop. And then, Car and then Rockefeller and his agents and people in the CIA, connected to the CIA, like George H.W. Bush, Ted Shackley, they're involved in this October surprise scandal where they talk to the Iranians and they say, don't release the hostages while Carter is trying to negotiate this. Hold on to them and we'll give you a better deal. We'll sell you weapons and so on for your war that you're going to have to fight against Iraq now because we've told Iraq to attack you. The Iran-Iraq war, which goes on all throughout the 80s. They secretly negotiate with this. There's a lot of evidence that this happened. Even the New York Times wrote something on it recently that's more or less saying like, yeah, there's more evidence that this happened. And that was how Carter was brought down. He, had, he was for forced to do all these things that were damaging to him by these oligarchs. And then those same oligarchs, they turn on him. And, he's, and the spook sabotaged his plan to have the hostages released. So the hostages get held 
right until the moment that Reagan is being inaugurated and then they're released. Speaking of Bush, of course, George Bush Jr., he's at the head of the fourth structural deep event being 9-11. That is one that you talk about more towards the very end of the book, which to me seemed to be the most inconclusive with regard to the deep events as to how much we actually know, how much we can conclude. But there was enough in there to certainly raise a lot of questions and doubts. Would you like to elaborate as to to what extent 9-11 is a deep event and why and what we do know about it and what we should be inquiring? Well, I wrote with Peter, the American exception empire in the deep state really stops in, in terms of having a more serious historical narrative or a continuous historical narrative. It stops with Reagan's election, more or less. But I do talk about things like 9-11 and the use of jihadi networks. Basically, after the Cold War ends, you have the U.S. using these Afghan, Arab Afghans, these networks like Al-Qaeda that were set up to facilitate the Mujahideen's activities in Afghanistan. They're used all over the place as like shock troops for U.S. imperialism. So they're used in Azerbaijan. They're used in Chechnya. They're used in Bosnia. They're used in Kosovo. They're used in Libya. They try to use them to, they try to use Al-Qaeda people to assassinate Gaddafi in like 96 or something like that. I mean, these are like, sock, these are basically the, they're still doing the U.S. jihadi thing, right? And then suddenly in the later 90s, they turn against the U.S., right? But like, even when they do and they, you know, they attack on 9-11, what does it really accomplish? It just allows the U.S. a pretext to launch wars that it had already been speaking about in policy papers and everything else, which raises the question like, you know, okay, they were working for the U.S. in the 80s, and in the 90s, they're used as these sort of shock troops and sock puppet, you know, proxy forces all across, you know, the Eurasia. And now on 9-11, they like, oh, they attack you and turn on you, but um, the consequences that you can just do more of the imperialist things that you had said, like you really had to do no matter what anyway. I mean, that's the outcome. So you can just looking at it on its face. And then you also see how we use these jihadi networks to try to take down Gaddafi, you know, under Obama. Those are used to get rid of Gaddafi. They're used in Syria. Um, you know, people suspect that ISIS is basically like a U.S. sock puppet. For good. That's what everybody in Iran basically or in Iraq Patrick Coburn reported on this years ago that like, if you ask anybody in Iraq, they all say ISIS is the United States. I mean, what is, what are these groups really? So, you know, it's not to say that it's exactly a false flag because there are these groups of, of people who are dedicated jihadis, but like, how did these people get financed? Who set them up and created them for what purpose? I mean, think about the fact that we know Hamas was more or less created by the right-wing Israelis as a way to make sure there couldn't be a Palestinian state, you know, because you split them from the, you split Gaza from the West Bank and you create you, you, this sort of terrorist force that you can say like, oh, they're terrorists, they're crazy. We got to, there's no negotiating with these people. It's because they didn't want a Palestinian state. You know, the British Empire created the Muslim Brotherhood for imperial chicanery purposes. This is, it's not really a, a new thing even. Um, and people should look at it with much skepticism. But with regards to 9-11 specifically, is how much do we know with regard to whether it was an inside job? Because it's kind of become a popular meme at this point. And one of the most famous people to inquire about 9-11 was, of course, Michael Moore in his documentary Fahrenheit 9-11. But I don't know, to me, I have the doubt that Bush really knew about any of this or even people in the high command. But it's, it seems suspect. You talk about, I believe it was the FBI or as a CIA had like information that they knew oh, yeah. was happening, but they didn't inform the other agency. Um, right. There's a whole lot that's been written about that. Like Richard yeah. Lee and Kofor Black, Tom Wilshire and other people. The Road to 9-11 is one that people should read or just read that we have four articles on at Covert Action Magazine that were that dealt with 9-11. So those give you a really good overview of, you know, the geopolitical background of it. And then some of the ways in which CIA people intervened to make sure that the hijackers were not detected because uh, they should have been if normal procedures were followed. They had to intervene to make sure they wouldn't be, uh, which is more indication that this was something that was allowed to go forward and facilitated in who knows what ways. As far as who knew about it, Bush himself, I don't think that he would have been needed to know much about anything. Cheney and Rumsfeld were involved in continuity of government. They were connected to very right-wing forces going way back. I mean, Donald Rumsfeld back in the 60s like was inquiring to Bobby Kennedy about like, hey, why are you trying to 
classified the American Zionist network as a foreign agent. You know, I'd like to know some more about what you're trying to do there. So he was already connected to these right wing, what would become neoconservatism, you know, the Zionist lobby in the United States. And that's who was really behind the Iraq war. I mean, in large part, they had a document produced by Bibi Netanyahu with people that would go on to work in the Bush administration, Douglas Fife, David Wormser. That's called the, the document's called A Clean Break. And they were calling for a break with the peace process and uh, starting the Iraq war and getting rid of the Saddam Hussein regime, basically remaking the Middle East to make uh, Israel, uh, to make it so Israel would never be threatened, you know, and greater Israel could be achieved and there wouldn't be a Palestinian state. These were all like spelled out, you know, pretty much. And so, uh, then Bush takes over and he puts these people in high places, that Feith and Wormser, but then also Cheney and, and Rumsfeld. And these are the hard right. It's like this alliance between the, the Zionist parts of the deep state, pro-Israel parts, and then more, con more traditional oil and military industrial complex people like Cheney. This was, these were the forces that uh, propelled the U.S. to war in Iraq, and you needed something like 9-11 before you'd be able to launch these wars and do what they wanted to do. And the follow-up to 9-11, which is right afterwards, which they get, the state gets caught doing this, is the anthrax letters. These letters that were sent with anthrax poison in them, they killed a few people, and they said things like, death to America, Allah is great, down with Israel. And then they eventually uh, discover that these came from a U.S. lab. So then they have to find somebody to blame for it. They, end up, they, they find one guy, and then he's able to say, like, no, it wasn't me. They find another guy, Bruce Ivins, and he denies that he did it. And then he just conveniently commits suicide, we are told, after that. But everybody that, pretty much everybody that looked at the case and the technical details of it said he couldn't have been the person that did that. Um, so, you know, 9-11 is very suspicious. I'm less in the um, mode these days of really becoming the master of forensic details on, especially on 9-11, but even on some of these other ones, the bigger picture is more what you look at, I think. And the empire, you look at all these events and you see how they all, they work out in ways that allow um, imp the empire, the more aggressive and, and predatory and military and economic the segments of the you know U.S. regime to benefit, and uh, it's been to the benefit of the U.S. and this global dominance project. Except that in the 21st century, it's actually been damaging the U.S. position. For whatever reason, in the 21st century, the U.S. breaks with like normal realism and rational pursuit of empire and and the U.S. national interest on an, in an imperialist way. And they start doing dumb things like trying to, to occupy Afghanistan, which is a huge waste and is impossible, right? Alexander the Great, the Brits, nobody, the Russians, nobody is going to be able to run that place except for people who are Afghanistan, Afghan, Afghans, right? Um, and Iraq was a disaster. Syria was a failure. We're basically just, we've invaded Russia, and are occupying it. Yeah, Russia, Ukraine, even with Gaza is now is like a, you know, because... The, Israel's intertwined with the U.S. so much. And like, what are they going to, are they, can they get something that looks like victory out of that? Like by, it seems like what they want to do is to eradicate the population. If they are, if they succeed in that, is that even going to be a victory? Or is that going to be the most delegitimizing thing for all time for them? I, I think they've lost their minds. Maybe that Zionist element of the establishment that was behind, that was fueling things like the Iraq war, presumably Syria, you know, because that regime is a threat to uh, Israeli dominance in the region. Maybe Israel explains a lot more of the mysteries of like why we keep doing such crazy things that are counterproductive mm -hmm. because they are a part of the deep state. They're a segment of the deep state. There's actually, they're not just about dollars and cents and common, you know, pursuing an empire in a rational way. They like actually have a, their own crazy metaphysic, their own, um, their own doomsday worldview of, of these things. I mean, it's some biblical, I mean, it's, it seems now the scales are kind of falling from a lot of people's eyes and the craziness of what Israel is and tries to do is kind of undeniable. And it's the derangement of its supporters and how they're blind to like a genocide. And these are people that are not, I mean, it, you'd have to, it's sad to say, but you have to look at like what happened to Germany in the 30s to have something similar. How can otherwise reasonable, nice, educated people in a in an affluent society be so insane? And uh, it's some ideological um, thing. It's a it's quite something.
it probably has had a bigger role in guiding the U.S. to disaster in the 21st century than uh, people are comfortable recognizing. The very last question I wanted to ask you before I let you go is something that is very relevant to our contemporary situation, and that is, to what extent is Donald Trump an enemy of the deep state? Because that is something his supporters claim, and it's something that I find an interesting question worth even asking, because I doubt, based on his cabinet that he had before, that he's really an enemy, because he had a lot of these neocons in his cabinet, like Mike Pompeo. He has a extremely hawkish foreign policy in support of Israel. Uh, you know, with Jared Kushner and, and whatnot. However, he, he does seem at some to some level clearly a threat to the image of, of the deep state or uh, perhaps his incompetence is a threat. I'm curious to what extent, because he's increasingly been claiming that the deep state's out to get him and, and you see all these efforts to now st- prevent him from running in the election. I don't know, to what extent do you think he's enemy of the deep state or perhaps the motives the deep state would have for getting him out of there? Because I don't think he really damaged them that much when he was in power. Well, he has backers, um, hard right wing Zionist backers. Some of his biggest supporters are of that stripe. So that's a part of the deep state that has supported him, a segment of the deep state, you know, that is um, powerful, apparently. And then he has other, he has his own money and he has other backers. I think he's a threat to the more traditional deep state and the more reasonable one and and the, that is not that has a bigger vision than just like making sure their friends make some money and that, you know, Israel is safe. So so Trump is a strange figure, kind of an American, a right wing, a Bircherite kind of America first person, but also very pro-Israel, which is sort of incompatible. I mean, it seems that he was, his backing, his decisive backing seems to have been from the Israel lobby in terms of like what parts of the establishment really liked Trump. Now, as far as whether the bigger establishment or deep state really, how much they hate Trump, I think the issue is, and, and this is coming to the fore regardless, is that he is such a bad look for the U.S. And for one thing, he doesn't like the wars, the forever wars. He avoided them. He didn't start any new wars. I'm not saying he's a dove or he's an anti-war, anti-imperialist person at all. He rhetorically comes out against wars and he didn't start any new wars. And I think he didn't start any new wars because Almost he understood. Did. Iran. Well, he's. I mean, he it was a, he's a criminal. He murdered Soleimani. It's it's horrendous. But he didn't start any big, long, major wars, and that is is notable. And look at what Biden has done. Biden has two crazy wars going on his watch: Ukraine, which is a proxy war, and then Gaza. And look at how much it's damaged him. That's why I think Trump was anti. Why he struck an anti-war pose, and he didn't actually start wars. Is be- not because he had any principles, but because he understood that was bad for him politically. And that's all he really cares about is himself. You know, I think Biden got to where he was by being whatever the establishment wanted him to be. I mean, he is a non-entity as far as I'm concerned. Even in his prime, he was a non-entity. And now it's just, it's ridiculous. They may as well just have a statue of Joe Biden or a Ronald McDonald statue could be our president. It would be about the same. But it's, you know, as for Trump, like, he he is such a bad look for them. It is so delegitimizing, and the U.S. hegemony is teetering, and having a, a, a head of state who is so symbolically bad for the U.S. and such a bad look for the rest of the world, I think that's the main problem that they have. He makes the U.S. look like an empire unmistakably in decline and a place that is very messed up, which it is. And my Trump, just Trump in that way, Trump is the president the oligarchy deserves, but not the one that we deserve or the world deserves. Sure, yeah. I mean, also his incompetence. He wasn't the he raided by the FBI his office due to having documents that he wasn't supposed to have, and yeah, uh, I mean, I, yeah, he I, accidentally I, seems to leak classified information. He just seems like just a huge liability for them on a more practical level. I mean, he seems like an unserious person, but in reality, the secrecy regime is so ridiculous that, I mean, the pre- he's the president of the United States. He is supposed to be able to see the secret documents. If they explained why this was so scandalous by explaining what documents were there and the impact of them, we're just told, as far as I understand, that he takes these documents and he didn't handle them very well. But he, the counter argument is that, well, the president can declassify anything that he chooses to. And so once I do that, they're declassified. That's a plausible argument. And, you know, again, it gets to this question of like, if the president can't be trusted with these things, who is supposed to be? That doesn't make Richard Nixon a good guy. It doesn't make Donald Trump a good guy, certainly. 
but the it it seems to be a kind of political warfare that they're using because the the, the other the, the anti Trump forces don't have anybody that they can really rally around. Biden is enormously unpopular. Whatever Democrat they put in, they're going to try to parachute him in. I don't even think they want to have a primary. I don't think it's going to be Biden to be honest, but I don't think they want a primary either. The they have no good options at this point. They really the establishment needs to bow to reality and reform a number of things. Israel needs to give up on the idea of greater Israel because with U.S. hegemony collapsing, it's not even tenable anyway. But we have lunatics, lunatics in charge of the U.S. and lunatics in charge of Israel, and these are basically two different forms of fascism that, that pretend not to be. The U.S. is a kind of secret, you know, disguised fascism with this deep state, really that can overrule democracy friendly fascism yeah that's one that's the bertrand gross right he wrote that book and uh that's one aspect of it but he doesn't even get into the the clandestine side of it which is like okay there's an unfriendly side of it he's only referring to the visible corporate way that fascism can sort of reproduce itself pretending to be democracy it's even worse than that because there's actually the knife you know the long knives are there it's the clandestine state look at jfk JFK was not killed by friendly fascism. He was killed by the unfriendly kind, the kind that blows your brain out the back of your head like while you're driving down the street sitting next to your wife. That's not friendly. Okay, that's the American side. And the Zionist side is, I mean, they're more like blood and soil fascism. It's uh, like that. They're eliminationist blood and soil fascism. I, I think you have to admit that's what the state is. They were called an apartheid state, which is a pretty you know, nasty thing to begin with. And now they're eliminationist. Like it's, they want to carry out a genocide and just get rid of all the people living in Gaza um, and then build some high rise apartments there or oil refineries or whatever. I mean, this is, and the rest of the world is moving on. So that's what I think makes this period so interesting is that the deep state and the, the fact that it can control the media and it can have all these covert operations to make events happen that they want to. They're, they've run into the limits of what they can actually accomplish. And we're now at a point where, you know what, instead of just trying to kill everybody and dominate the world, real, understand realistically that this, that is not tenable anymore and try to make a better world and fo follow the law, follow laws, international laws, and try to solve human problems because they don't really have the option to go around being, you know, the biggest dicks in the world anymore. They need to actually act like human beings who have some interest in the well-being of humanity rather than just wealth and power because they can't have that anymore. They can't be the empire, the global gangster anymore. They don't have the material ability to do that anymore. Yeah. In that aspect of the underworld, the whole criminality, which a lot of these big analysis that try to depict America as some sort of new kind of totalitarianism like the friendly fascism book and most importantly the book that uh, i was heavily influenced by was sheldon wallen's inverted totalitarianism which you also cite as an influence of yours i originally actually even looked up um I, I was looking up stuff from the deep state that's how i found you and how i found your book because one thing i found that was lacking in wallen's book was that he also cites the evolution of the national security agencies and after world war ii and the cold war and how it transforms into this more totalitarian system a totalizing system, but he doesn't actually get into the extent to which the actual totalitarian element, which your book does excellently. I think it's a really good supplementary uh, source for that larger research. Perhaps I might even cite in a video about inverted totalitarianism, because I think that's kind of what lacks in, in that part. So for those uh, listeners who are might be still skeptical, who might think maybe this is some quackery, I highly suggest picking up Aaron's book. It's really thorough. There's a lot of evidence. He cites everything. And I believe it was your uh, PhD dissertation before, right? Yeah, it was a, a political science dissertation at Temple University. My professors are all tenured professors, academics, you know, so I had to be very precise with my footnotes and my conclusions and assessments of things. Uh, it's not an it's not something that you'd find on info or illuminati.com or whatever. It's really about the, about state criminality. Um, and th there's, the thing, the amount of things that I point to that are documented and that are that we know are, are true are shocking, and the things that are pretty obviously true, but the government still doesn't want to admit, like the JFK assassination or the RFK assassination. These things are shocking too, and people don't 
realize how much evidence there is to point to the, the apex of power really being the culprit here. I mean, JFK was shot from the front and that was clear right away and they obscured that and they want to deny that up to the present day. He couldn't have been shot from somebody in the place where they said Oswald was. And for Robert Kennedy, we know he wanted to investigate his brother's assassination and that he planned to do it as president. And then when he gets assassinated, the guy they put in jail for it is standing three to six feet in front of him, firing, you know, a gun at his, towards him. But the bullet that killed Kennedy was fired at point blank range at a sharp upward angle from behind, right to left, like a right-handed person standing behind him just came up, put a gun on the back of his head. Well, everybody was looking at this crazy Sirhan Sirhan guy shooting wildly. Somebody else just came up to RFK and shot him in the back of the head. They've never gotten to the bottom of that either. These are out there in the record and we don't have any recourse. And what does that say? It, you could go nuts and say like, I demand the answers. I demand the answers. Release the files. The bigger, perhaps more immediate takeaway is that we have an illegitimate, undemocratic system that gives itself the prerogative of vetoing democracy. And that is a part of the problem. So it doesn't mean necessarily, oh, democ democracy doesn't work because of X, Y, and Z. Like you just, you need to have a lawful state. And I think that because they decided to go for empire after World War II, they just created this lawless sovereign power that's opaque. We can't see it. And they essentially repurposed fascism to make a new kind of fascism because you had to run a global empire. And now the whole world is sick of it and it's crumbling and there's, they can't just murder their way out of this. Uh, and I really hope they don't try. I hope they don't blow up the world. Right. Yeah. Great uh, note to end on. So yeah, I highly recommend checking out Aaron's American Exception podcast. You can find a link in the description. You can find a link to his book in the description as well. If you also want to support the One Dime Radio podcast and my One Dime channel on Patreon, you can as well. Thank you for listening. Feel free to give a five-star rating if you got value out of this. And peace out. My only hope is that when enough people become pessimist, then out of despair, somebody maybe does something. But you know why I also like to be a pessimist? Because it's the only way to have a nice life. If you're an optimist, then always bad things happen and you are always uh, disappointed. When you are a pessimist, then you look around, okay, there are bad, but from time to time something nice happens and you are, as a pessimist, you are a little bit glad all the time, no? You are listening to One Dime Radio. Become a patron at patreon.com slash one dime to support the show and get access to extra content.